All right, guys, welcome to uh, Advanced Ford Programming. Uh, this is the second part of our Ford Programming introduction here. Uh, I'm Chris Snyder. I work with Opus IVS. I work in the tech support and do some programming as well. Um, if you guys haven't talked to me before, a um, bunch of you guys, I'm sure I see some of the names that I recognize on the other side. Um, let's just kind of get right to it. We're going to dive in a little deeper than we did last time here on our Ford Programming. Uh, hopefully, we can get a little bit more information and answer some of the questions you guys had on some of the other things in a regular cut and dry programming. Um, today, we're going to talk about used PCM programming. We're going to talk about coding a used ABS module with a VIN in it from another vehicle. Um, we're going to get into the PATS introduction and expand that a little bit here. And I'm going to try and give you a brief overview of FDRS so you can at least see what's coming if you haven't experienced it yourself. All right, and of course, because you know all things are paid by advertisement, uh, our Drive Pro ES, um, we're giving away a free battery maintainer charger, uh, $600 value if you sign in for the Drive Pro ES. Uh, there'll be a few more details up towards the end of here. Um, charger is really important for programming. Uh, regular battery chargers just kind of don't regulate the voltage the way they're supposed to. And uh, it's just not the healthiest way to program. Besides being a clean power source, this does operate in a fixed voltage ranges that we need for this. Okay, quick review of the Ford software. All right, so we're going to talk about IDS. We're going to talk about FJDS and FDRS, the newest version of that Ford software. Okay, so IDS is used with the Ford pass-through, uh, Ford VCM, VCM2, VCM3, VCMM. You know, we got a whole bunch of different uh, options here. That's uh, full dealer-level diagnostics on all modules, all applications. Um, with the exception of the APIM, there's some extra stuff to jump in through there, that sync module. Um, that has to be programmed through the Ford website. Uh, FJDS software we use with our J boxes or VCM2 or later. Um, the VCM1 does not work as it's not a J2534 pass through. Um, and we are limited by the VCI as to which networks it can talk on. Normally it affects like a UBP network and some modules on medium speed CAN that don't fully program the way you would expect them to. FDRS is the newest version, a cloud-based version of our software. We use that with a VCM2 or later, J2534-2. Um, I recently just had an issue with the Snap-on Pass-Through Pro 2. Didn't quite meet the hardware standards, but I think the 3 works just fine. Um, that's full diagnostic dealer-level programming. You know, just about everything you need to do on the select models there. The APIM still gets programmed. A little bit different than all the rest of them. Uh, service information um, is what you're going to use. We need a Ford VCM to use that service information for the APIM programming. And there's also some diagnostic toolbox functions that we can use in the Ford website, but I didn't get too far into that in here today. Uh, pricing on subscriptions. You know, if you take a look, the short term for FJDS is much cheaper than the short term for IDS. So if you have a, a module that you need to square away, you know, just a one-time use programming might be a little cheaper that way, works with both hardwares. Um, IDS would be full function, not just programming only. So we have uh, our new software we're dealing with, the FDRS software. As you can see, we started phasing it in in 2018. It uh, looks like by 2021, every model is going to require FDRS. So if you haven't, you know, gotten into it yet, it is something to, to start looking towards as long as we have the hardware we need for this. Um, the software itself is included in the same licensing that we use for FDRS or FJDS or FJDS or IDS. Uh, we'll talk about computers for a quick second. We have minimum requirements that Ford looks for. Um, some software will run just fine on an earlier version. Uh, you can get away with it and stuff does work, but if you call Ford for assistance, you need to make sure you meet their minimum specifications where most of the time they just don't even want to listen to your complaint. Um, one of the most important things moving forward 
you know, solid state hard drives, good bit of memory, quality internet connection in the shop. Um, yes, there is a VCM3 that is in the works and is released by Ford, but it's currently on back order. Um, but as far as the FDRS software, um, that solid state hard drive, extra memory, and uh, that solid, you know, internet connection is really what's going to keep you going, speed the software up. It does drag on really slow when your hardware doesn't quite meet the requirements. And uh, if you spend a little bit of money on the hardware, it's definitely money well spent and speeds up the process. Uh, a few quick links and guides here for information. Uh, we talked about quick guides in the base programming, um, calibration reference information for model year, as built data as we pull that data. And there are some weird instances where IDS or FJDS can't find files on the server, and that file download link will take you there, and you can download them by file name directly. Uh, the phone number on the bottom is for Rotunda Support, and they are the aftermarket contacts for IDS, FJDS, and FDRS operation. So we're just gonna jump right in here with this uh, 2006 uh, Lincoln Navigator. We're talking uh, use module programming. And as much as I don't like to dog the aftermarket world, aftermarket remand modules typically need to be treated as a used module when it comes to programming. They're not typically virginized. All the data is not wiped out of them. Even if the VIN is changed, you know, there's still other functions that get written in with the software. So OEM process for, you know, doing these programmings, PCM in the car, read the data from the old one, follow the prompt, switch it over, throw it back in with the new one. The PCM writes, the software writes the information into the PCM and everything is just kind of back the way it was. Um, but that's not going to work on this because if we uh, pull the data from a used module or something that's already written in there, it's only going to read that information that's in there, and it's going to send that send in, send the same information back into that module. So we won't have the right information by VIN for this vehicle. So what we need to do is we need to ID the vehicle without talking to the module. So the easiest way to do this, just leave the key off. And as we go through and ID the vehicle. This is from FJDS here. IDS looks almost identical. The big difference is uh, the amount of functions in the toolbox here. So we connect through. FJDS is looking for a pass-through as opposed to a Ford VCM. And we start communication. We're not going to be able to talk to the module because the key's off. So as we have the key off, we just kind of click through these prompts, but we don't turn the key on. We ignore that because we don't want to talk to what's in there. So it's going to ask us if we want to retry, and we're going to hit no. And then as we go, we're going to ignore all these key prompts because it's trying to have us activate the vehicle and read information from the modules. After probably about a half a dozen key cycles, at least prompts for it, it'll tell you you can't talk to the vehicle, and we need to identify it another way. So with the exception of a few rare Mazdas, I think in the late 90s, anytime you're in this screen, you're going to be under the All Other tab. Um, and then it's going to tell us we're going to use the tear tag number or the PCM port number. And uh, this gives us the screen to enter this. A quick note, if you guys do have scaling on your laptops that you're running IDS or FJDS on, you may not be able to fit all the digits into these text boxes. So if you do have an issue fitting the digits in there, you can check for scaling settings on the same page as the resolution for your monitor. So to get the tear tag information, yet again, we got those nice uh, quick guides and free resources for the outside world from Ford. And we're gonna come down to module as build data here. Punch in our VIN number or I am not a robot code. And it gives us our module as build data. As you can see, I highlighted the tear tag number on the top of here. This information is readily available. If you can get a hold of the PCM part number that belongs in the vehicle, you could use that data as well. But the tear tag number is normally the most convenient way to identify it. When you put the information on this page, it is best to just pick one identifiable 
uh, value here and not to just fill out every line in here. So we just put the tear tag number in and then it identifies the vehicle. At this point, we're still leaving the key off. Um, that tear tag number should tell the software or not the VIN number, but the vehicle identification, the calibration level for the emissions and typically driveline information, automatic manual transmissions. So at this point, we still have the key off. We could put the VIN number in here or not. There is another spot forward of here where it's actually gonna tag it to write it into the module. And on this screen, if you ever need to take notes, if you're doing multiple sessions with your vehicles, that RO line is kind of like, a, you know, you can write first, second, third, you know, if you're making several sessions for a vehicle, if you're having issues with something. So we punch in our VIN number and then we move forward. So before we actually write the module, we're gonna use this special function. And as we talked about the inhale exhale process um, with our normal programming, if we use these special functions, we can find them under the ball and socket, top left corner, the Swiss army knife down the bottom and then special function. Most people will only use the function 53061. That number is the number to ignore the module configuration parameters for programming. It might be a little bit overkill to do this with the key off, but I have had several programmings, especially with aftermarket modules that were remands that without this function, it didn't prompt for the right information. So then after we hit the special function, we're gonna go back to our programmable module installation for the PCM and up until we see this install new module and vehicle prompt, we want the key off the whole time. We don't want this key on because we don't want to read anything yet. So now that it says install new module, it's going to prompt for our VIN number here. If there was a VIN written in the module that it did read, at some point it may ask you, is this VIN correct? Or if the vehicle reads it from another module. So answer the prompts truthfully, make sure the correct VIN is in here punched in properly because this is what will be written. And then it's looking for vehicle data. Uh, this vehicle data is like a computer kind of shortcut of uh, the VIN number and some other configuration information. If you miss enter the VIN and put in the vehicle data, it won't let it go through. So part of that vehicle data has check digits for the VIN number. Um, you know, we get that right from that module as build page. We enter the vehicle data as it's listed on there. We grab the next line for PCM1 down the bottom. We punch these values in and we just kind of continue through the system. Once we get all these numbers in, it's gonna tell us, you know, make sure that you, if you got to fix them, this is all six liter warnings and stuff. But at this point, we're getting ready for the right process. Next prompt is gonna be our key on, and then it's gonna start to write or module calibration. So this part of the right that we see with this blue bar graph, this is the, the strategy used for the engine that's in there, for the emissions configuration in there. So this isn't like the, the fine tuning of the characteristics of the car, the axle ratio, the tire size. Um, this programming portion here is, you know, this vehicle was built with this emissions level and this is the software that the module needs to run on. So then at the end of that, it'll tell you to turn it off. For this particular vehicle, that was all the input it required. I've had several other vehicles. At this point, it'll have you turn the key back on and it will prompt you for things like tire size, axle ratio, with or without cruise control. Um, enter in the data that's on there, you know, just kind of match up what's on the car. If you do have access to Ford service information, the tire size and axle ratio that belongs with the vehicle is typically on there. If not, we can decode the sticker from the driver's door jam with the service information. So we come back and turn our key on. And after it cleared those codes, it tells us our calibration, this calibration successfully written in. At this point, our module's programmed. It's written to the vehicle, it should be all configured here. Um, the vehicle's still not gonna start until we write PATS, but we're gonna cover PATS a couple slides down in another section of this here. So we're talking other used modules here, used ABS, 
Um, we constantly come into contact with these. It was a high failure rate. Um, you know, on mid to late 2000s, pre-2010 F-Series, you know, we had some issues with those and on the expeditions. And it's pretty common to see used modules go on these. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we ID the vehicle like we normally would. And then before we go to programming here, we have an as, oh, let me back up one screen. This particular vehicle does not have the as-built option on the programming menu. This next slide here is going to show the as-built option that some of the later vehicles have. Typically, if you're throwing a used module in a, in a vehicle, you want to run through the as-built process and then go back through the PMI if it's there. If we do not have the as-built process available listed, like in this first menu here for this 2008, we need to go through the similar process like we did with the PCM. We're going to use that update special function. We're going to leave that module alone in the vehicle, the replacement module installed. Then we go through our PMI. As it tells us to install this new module, you know, it should not have previously pulled the data from the module that was in there. And it prompts for the as built data like this. So we go back to our as built feed, you know, pull the data from the site, transfer it over, punch them in as we need to go. And that module configuration gets written in the way it should. Then we go back, and this was a, a VIN mismatch issue on this AVS module. And uh, that B2900 was resolved with pulling the, with that special function. So it did not pull that same build data from the module. So we look at this as build data and we wonder what could possibly be in all this. And, you know, this is just one of those things that kind of piqued my interest as I started seeing patterns in here. And we can look at several modules in an as built listing and see that there's a lot of similar numbers in, in this as built. So as we start looking into this a little further, if we take the first four lines of this ABS, and then every line, the last two digits are a check digit. So we kind of just knock them off the side. So we're looking at 17 characters. We can take these 17 characters and convert them through some magic of the online wonders of the internet. Um, and as we do, we can actually find that the first 17 values in this uh, as-built data is plain and simply the vehicle identification number. So, you know, there are more things than the VIN number in this, but if you do have module mismatch um, faults and your VIN number does look like this, it's probably, you know, the ignore the inhale, that special function to write this stuff through. And uh, that, that should be able to get these to overwrite these to correct those VIN mismatch faults. So as far as programming used modules for Ford, um, airbag modules are a no-go. Uh, it won't let you overwrite the VIN with factory software. Um, used ABS modules, um, somewhere around 2008, 2009, up to like 2012, if you go to program a used ABS module with the factory software, it will tell you you need to pull the data from the original module or install a blank module. Um, if you get a blank one from the dealer, it'll let you write it, but the factory software won't let you overwrite a used ABS in that year range. Um, and we've also been seeing issues uh, with like Mustang PCMs not being able to flash those back to stock. Um, but for the diesels and stuff, when we do this, like our, our tear tag programming, like we showed you here, that's kind of the same process we're going to use when we flash these things back to stock. You know, we're going to go through and uh, rewrite the calibration based on the tear tag number. But the Mustangs specifically have done something different with the software and the module, and it's not allowing us to rewrite these as we used to be able to. So, and if we're for some reason trying to switch a body control module over, um, the CEI lock configuration, which configures whether it has paths or no paths in the system, um, that configuration, once it's performed or once I think it's a 500 mile limit, it automatically flips it. Um, once that's locked in, it can't be switched. So, 
think we have six or seven models over like eight or nine years that use the same body control module hardware part number. They all have different software written into them, but the CEI lock configuration uh, gets performed on these. And if you go from a PATS to a no PATS vehicle, there's no way to turn it back to no PATS once it's locked out. And if it's looking for antennas and stuff like that that aren't on the vehicle, you'll never be able to get that to start. So as we're talking about Ford PAT systems here, um, you know, we got old keys, new keys, smart keys. Um, all in all, the systems are, are pretty basic. Uh, we have two main types of keys besides wireless or not, but we have OEM style keys that are programmed to the vehicle on site. You can get them from the dealership, you can get them through locksmiths, but they're the ones you need the car and software to pair up. And then we have, you know, the horror that all of us programming run across at some point, the clone key. You know, we went down to Joe's Hardware, he put the key in a box and pulled it out and now it starts my car. It's good that it starts your car, but we can't use that one for programming. Um, the actual learn process is bi-directional. And uh, that stuff does change a little bit inside the key and the clone keys, just the process doesn't happen. So two basic types of PAT systems for those of you who are encountering them. We have single module or a PCM based system. Only the PCM is involved. Our PAT antenna is wired to the PCM. If we put a PCM in, we need two keys when we write the software because we got to have two learned. And, you know, if that's, all we're doing, that's the only time we're touching keys. Um, then we look at our two module systems where we have a PATS module, which could be the instrument cluster, a standalone PATS module, junction box, or FA for those uh, intelligent access push button keys. Um, those modules require a handshake to be introduced to each other to the PCM when they first get installed. We call it a parameter reset. Um, those systems require two keys when the PATS module is replaced, but a parameter reset is required with the PATS module or the PCM. So the most important part is unless the module holding the keys is being replaced, we can get away with a single key. If the module that holds the keys is what we're replacing, we need two. Um, on rare occasions, when you have a used module, you can use an add a key function if there's still two stored in there. But that's kind of another, you know, the unicorn of the job. Everything doesn't work out the way it should all the time. So if we went into service information, if we didn't know what went into PATS, um, if we look into principles and operations, most aftermarket information in the factory stuff has all the same stuff listed there. But it'll tell you in here, the control functions are contained in the PCM on this 2006 Navigator. And then we compare that to this 2008 F-250 where it says our PATS control functions are located in the instrument cluster. So if, our, if we're replacing an instrument cluster, we need two keys on the F-250. If we're doing the PCM, you know, we just need to handshake that PCM to the instrument cluster. So all the PATS access for IDS, FJDS is done through the PATS functions menu. And when we open that up, you'll notice one of the first things is an idea of the key that we're looking at for the car. Maximum number of keys that the car can hold, minimum number after key erase. And I think it's only the transit and the transit connect and certain builds that require four keys, but almost everything Ford requires two after a key erase. So, and being as the control functions for this and the keys are stored in the engine computer, this parameter reset requirement is going to say no because under this screen, it is just the PCM. So, we have several options when we get into these patch functions menus. So, this is for a PCM based system. We have program additional key, key code erase, and program, which are two things that you would predominantly use on these. Um, the spare key programming enable disable can be turned on from this menu and that's where we can turn the key on in the ignition. We cycle two keys and then we could cycle a third key and the third key will start the vehicle. Um, unlimited key mode is really used for fleet vehicles. It's not something most people typically have to deal with. Um, 
And same thing with that, you know, the mode on or off or the unlimited key code. So if we go to another style system, this one was from a 2008 E-Series van with no paths. You notice the only thing in the menu is our parameter reset. So our parameter reset is pairing our instrument cluster, which would be the keeper of the keys if it did have pats with the PCM. So we do still have to do the handshake, even if it's just got a steel key, if the controls are in another module. Typically, we only see this on 2008 and newer E-series vans and F-series trucks. Most everything else that has a, a pats control is, you know, all the time pats installed. Um, police explorers and police Tauruses might be the exceptions, and some of the Ford Rangers in the, the mid-2000s were kind of go-no-go -go with PATS, but they were normally in the PCM. So this system here is a non-PCM controlled PATS. You notice the parameter reset function has been added to this menu. That parameter reset is our hardware handshake, and without that, we will, you know, even if we get the keys to learn, the module's still not going to start because we're going to have PCM ID invalid codes like a U2510 or a PCM ID mismatch and still a 1260 in the PCM at that point. So this one here is for uh, integrated access or intelligent access vehicle. You notice we have a parameter reset for the BCM and RFA, and that's separate from the BCM and the PCM. So when we go to do PATS functions on a new body control module on a push button start vehicle, before we can even power the car up, we have to do a parameter reset between the BCM and the RFA. Once we go through that 10 minute delay or security access, you know, we do the parameter reset, we disconnect the tool, cycle the key, now the car powers up. Now we can do our programming, our key learn, our parameter reset, for the body control and the PCM because we couldn't power up the PCM at the time to do the parameter reset on the first go round. So there are a lot of extra steps with the, the intelligent access keys, the push button start. But you know, if you, we put a body control module in and we can't talk to the core and it was a push button start, we need to start identify the vehicle with the tear tag like we were showing you for blank module programming. Then we would go into our PATS functions and we can go into uh, parameter reset for the RFA and the BCM and that'll get us to where we can key up the vehicle and finish the programming process. So uh, as of 2013, Ford has started adding coded PATS access back in their system. Um, Mazda system is in code, out code. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of, you know, things like that and other car lines that use it, but Ford's is integrated into their software. Um, the standard time and true Ford PATS access was a 10 minute delay. We used to run, you know, we hit our button. Let's see what we got listed here. Okay, timed access. So we have our, this procedure will take 10 minutes. We hit the button and this thing will count every bit of 600 seconds to get across the screen here. Once that gets across the screen, it'll access, our access will be granted and give us access to the PATS menus that we just looked at a few minutes ago. Now the coded access is a little bit different and this is where becoming a member with NASDAQ and having an LSID is uh, becoming more and more of an issue um, as we go forward and forward. So if we have dealer credentials, dealer licensing, dealer login, we can go that route. But if you do not have all dealer access, like most people wouldn't in the outside world, we're headed in the aftermarket column. So non-dealer use, you have to be registered with the NASDAQ registry, and you also need to create an account on the Motocraft website. We don't need to actually purchase anything on the Motocraft website, we just need those login credentials to tie your identity to this uh, programming process here. So we move forward prompts for your motorcraft information. If you do not fill out this information, it will not complete the process. As it adds the modules to PATS, it will list our PATS functions. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So the parameter reset is what we were chasing here. This was from a module replacement. Um, once we hit that parameter reset, the next thing it's looking for is our NASDEF username. That is your LSID number, all encoded numbers and letters. And the NASDEF password it's looking for in a second line here, that's going to come from the Authy app. Um, not your password to log into the website, but the Authy app rolling code. Once we click those, it'll validate the information online. Essentially, it takes your user information, the vehicle information, the PCM ID, it sends it into a server, the server answers back with another code, and that code gets us going into the next step here. It'll grant the security access for all the modules as we need, and then it clears that out. So we have, um, some of this is a little outdated, but depending on what years we're working on, it's good to know. Um, path lights, we have them in the instrument cluster, we have them up on the top of the dashboard. Um, after we program a module, when we do that key erase, when we turn that first key on, we should get a solid light on our paths indicator. That light is telling us number one, that it's in learn mode, number two, that it learned the first key. When we turn that key off, we put our second key in, that light should go out with our second key, telling us that it read the first key when the light was on solid, accepted a second key when the light went out. So now if we have no more flashing paths indicator, you know, our keys are learned to the vehicle. If we're fasting, flashing fast, uh, about three times a second, it's in theft lockout. We either didn't read the key, the key isn't stored, there should be some kind of DTC related to this fault. Our key off position, that lights once every two seconds, it's just a visual theft deterrent. They put that in the system, it's a low draw LED, doesn't drain batteries, you know, it's just, it's a visual indicator the system's alive. Um, and when we turn that key on, as long as that light comes off when the key is on, it accepted that current key is programmed, as read by the PATS module. That does not indicate whether or not a parameter reset was performed. But most PATS faults should trigger some kind of DTC. So if we have that solid light on still, we may have a B1213 where we have less than T keys programmed. Um, they have updated to these newer style DTCs on some of the new ones, B10D7. Um, there's some other tag numbers at the end of them to indicate whether the key wasn't read, it was an unprogrammed key, or if we haven't performed like a CEI lock configuration. So a uh, word to the wise, um, there are some aftermarket key programming tools that can force past that 10 minute delay by flipping between a coded and timed access. Um, I've recently seen issues where people have bricked modules to the point where we can't recover them with factory software. The locksmithing tools have changed over from coded to timed, and if we're not aligned with what the factory software is looking for, uh, we can't access these modules properly. Um, I've gotten one to recover with forced as-built programming, but I have had multiples that have not. So, you know, at that point, we're either looking at module replacement or that same locksmithing tool to see if it can realign the access where it needs to be. Um, if we're denied security access, um, we want to look for that access type in all the related modules for PATS. We want to look at all the key position data for PATS. We want to make sure when we turn a key off, the module knows the key's off. When we turn the key on, we want to make sure the module knows the key's on. Uh, we also want to take a look into like battery voltage and stuff like that. So um, the CEI lock configuration, like we talked about before, uh, once that is locked, locking the PATS type to that module, it cannot be undone. So this is just a screenshot from our drive tool. We were looking at the PATS security type was timed in this PCM. Um, if it's coded access for a vehicle that should be in timed, you know, anything before 2013 should be timed access. As long as it's timed, you know, we just, we, it's one other thing we don't need to look for. Just wanted to give you guys a quick introduction here to uh, FDRS, that's Ford's Diagnostic and Repair Software. 
Um, this is all web-based. We're going to use our Motocraft dealer logging credential or Motocraft website logging credentials, like we talked about. Um, we're going to select non-dealer as the user type. We're going to put our username and ID. And this licensing for this software is tied to IDS or FG FJDS installed on the same machine. So as we go through, this is you know a direct read from the vehicle. It's going to download some vehicle information, kind of like the network tests that we've seen before. And then where we previously saw, you know, is it a four valve California emission navigator? Now we're getting like full data on the vehicle. We got a build date comes up, all this by VIN, even a picture of the car. Um, if we look, we have columns, our, our computer names, descriptions of the modules, which are good because sometimes we have things with similar nomenclature that don't necessarily line up. And uh, that view continuous DTCs button at the top center there, it'll show orange if we have DTCs in a module, stored memory DTCs, green if we're all pass. Uh, the gray would be a non-communication, and if we have hard faults, they should show up in red. So when we come to our system self-test menu, um, they show the topography of our networks in the vehicle, what modules are on those networks, whether we can communicate with it. You know, we have that DSP down there. The vehicle probably wasn't equipped with an amplifier in here. Um, and as we have, you know, Green on this, orange on that, we can select the modules that we have codes in, or we can run all the modules together. So, you know, here we have, we're running three modules on high speed two, one on high speed three. All this goes through the gateway module. And uh, this is just another screenshot of a single module. And then when they come up all pass, they are all nice and green with nothing in there. Um, this screenshot was as we were chasing, I think this was a post-collision programming here. But if we look as, you know, not only do we have just the description here, I think we got a zoom in screen on this next one. As we look at the DTCs and we hover over, you know, that the telematics module there has a U3056. You know, yes, it's a control module. We hover over to 56 and it lets us know that we have a configuration fault. U3000 is a pretty common number for Ford to see internal electric failures, uh, battery voltage problems. So, you know, these tags on the end of these codes are very, very important on determining exactly what we're uh, configuring and fixing here. So this was also a, a programmable module replacement for the uh, ABS. Um, we had accelerometers that needed to be reset. And if you look in the column on the right, here is where we're going to run all our tools from. Uh, the far right hand, you see where it says downloading. Every time you run that module the first time, it needs to download that particular function to run from the software. So this is where internet connection is a must. Doing this remote is really going to cause us trouble. Um, when we download them, if we're running them, they'll say stop. Once they're downloaded, you can see we have the green run option there um, to be able to run certain functions. Um, running this even with a J2534, we do get live battery voltage on a scan tool, which is great when you're running through things and especially useful when you're programming just to make sure we don't have any voltage issues in our setup here. Um, service function here was just sensor calibration. is kind of click and shoot stuff. Here is our live data screen. You know, we have our description, the acronyms. We pick our PIDs that we want to see on this screen, kind of like IDS, we pick them on one screen first. And then when we move them over, you know, this is the standard graphing format. So we are able to modify these and change them and zoom in and do some other stuff with them. But I just wanted you guys to be able to see kind of what you're looking at before you get in there, because, you know, nothing's a little worse than, oh, I need this new software. Let's see what we got to do. You know, at least this way we have a little bit of exposure to it and uh, it kind of gets us in the right direction. So back to the corporate side here. Um, if you want an easier, more efficient way to program vehicles, um, we have the IVS 360 Drive Pro ES. Um, we have 
IVS live brand tech support. Um, I don't think there's many vehicles out there that we can't help you find a way through. Um, besides just the regular support for diagnostics, we also can assist in programming, programming software setup support, downloads, you know, and troubleshooting when stuff does go sideways. So we have real repair time guidance from our brand specific techs. Uh, I was just talking with Gina about this today. Uh, we're talking 208,000 plus vehicles last year. Um, you know, just a, an immense volume of people that, you know, uh, we're helping steer in the right direction and getting where they need to be to keep these cars on the road. You know, uh, we got five different development centers now, um, everything from program to support and software development. So, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, trying to bring in the big guns for you whenever you guys are set up on support here. And then, of course, our free webinar or our exclusive webinar offer, the free battery maintainer, uh, $600 value. Uh, I believe this one is the, what amperage is this? 150, where's it at? 90 amp output. That's what I thought it was. The Euro vehicles, you know, this is enough if those fans come on and pumps and stuff. This thing should be sufficient during programming without having to disconnect the whole world to get into programming on these. All right. Okay, so we had some questions in here. Let me see if we can find these for you. Hey, Chris. Gina here. Can you hey, hear me? Hey, Gina. Yes, I can. Yeah. Great. Um, so I've uh, marked some questions, and I'll uh, I'll start the Q and A off. Okay. Uh, is, first question from Paul uh, is: Is there a VCM three in the works or coming soon? The VCM3 has been released. There are several dealers that have it. I just looked, I think right now the release date was December 9th, which was yesterday. Um, I think they're going for about 1500 That VCM3 does add that third CAN channel and also opens up to the, the new CAN systems that they're opening up with the flexible data rate, where we're talking like 30 times as fast as, you know, older CAN technology that we're going to be able to write as this thing's like a variable rate under different circumstances. All right. Um, our next question is, how can the download file link on the, the as-built data page to be used? Okay. So if we have trouble typing stuff and we really want to get into the computer side of things, um, it actually will give you the file directory right on that page to download it. And all the data that you see on that screen, that file download, um, all the as-built data and module configuration is in a .ab file by the VIN number. So if we download that file and we move the file to the calibrations folder, it should be like F colon backslash programs forward motor company uh, calibrations or FJDS calibration, something like that. Um, it should be right on that website page when you do download it. Save it to the folder it tells you to, and then instead of having to manually type in the as-built data, it'll pull it from the file itself. All right. Um, our next question is, when using as-built, is the latest calibration or the assembly line calibration um, if so, should we check for updates after an as-built data programming event? Okay, so Paul, you're hitting all the right points of stuff that we kind of didn't dive too deep in. Um, as-built data is vehicle configuration. That is tire size, with or without heated steering wheel, you know, the, the specifics for that particular car. When we talk about calibrations and as-built data kind of puts us in two different realms. The as-built portion is typically the coding of the module, the configuration to the specific pieces built in the car. As to where our calibration information is typically more broad like the vehicle application software or the emissions level of the software in a PCM for that given engine. So the as-built data itself, yes, we can write the original configuration, but that doesn't necessarily tell us that we have the right software. And that's where the difference with the programmable module installation be performed 
But if we're putting a used module in, we could do the as-built force first if we have that as-built option, code the module to the correct coding, and then go do the programmable module installation to align the rest of the software with the vehicle. But don't forget the best process, if at all possible, ID the vehicle with the original module installed, pull the data from that module, and switch the module when the software tells you. These routines and processes are for working around issues when the module's not available, not communicating. You know, somebody ran a screw through the firewall and took out a PCM, put a stereo in. You know, the kind of things where you're just not able to get the information the right way. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, we got one more question from Paul. Uh, can I skip uh, CEI lock configuration until I get through the PAT programming, then go back and perform CEI lock configuration? Okay, so if we don't perform the CEI lock configuration, this is mostly when performing body control module replacements. I tend to be able to get through to PATS access and do all the things I need to do with FJDS because most days that's what I'm operating. And functions like CEI lock configuration, BMS reset, LIN module initialization, all those special functions for the end of body control module programming are not in the J software until the 2018 model year. So prior to that, I would finish my module programming to set up my configuration. We would do all of our paths functions to pair our modules and learn our keys. And then somewhere after that point, we're going through in our TPMS and running the special functions with either our Drive Pro or we've used our Farsight tablet or some other remote software um, to accomplish that as well. Great. Um, next question. Uh, I have heard you could replace used PCMs with one key using PATS and add a key. Is that, is that true? As long as the used module still has two keys stored in it from the other vehicle, you can add a key as a third key, and that should start and run the vehicle. But if for some reason you do need to erase keys, also be known that there's two key codes in there that you know don't necessarily belong to the vehicle. So yes, it does work in a pinch. It's not the best technique, um, but if the PCM holds the keys and you have to replace it with a used one and nobody erased it, you should be able to add that as a third key. If by chance maybe they had eight keys in there already and you go to add a ninth key, it probably won't allow you to do that. Or, you know, an aftermarket remand, they might clear the keys out before they send it to you. All right. Um, our next question from Michael Sasso, uh, just verifying, am I able to use VCM2 with FDRS? Correct. A VCM2 does work perfectly fine with FDRS. I use that personally. Um, Cardac Plus 3 works just fine. Snap-on Pass-Through Pro 3 works fine. Um, Bosch Master Tech MDI, I think, is on Ford Approves list as well. Great. Um, so a question from Jeff, is it possible to schedule a live demo for IVS 360? Jeff, we do offer Drive Pro ES IVS 360 demos. If you complete the uh, contact us form on our website, indicate that you're interested in Drive Pro ES or IVS 360, a sales rep will follow up with you uh, to schedule a demo. Yeah. Um, next question, uh, will IVS 360 allow security programming using my LSID? Uh, we do do security programming yes. and uh, requires, but we require that the end user has an LSID in order to carry out that right. LSID programming. We have special permission through NASDAQ to use, uh, you know, a sublet programming method is, you know, kind of the same thing a locksmith would do if he came out on site um, to your shop, you know, and use credentials that way if you ID'd with the customer. So it still does require the same documentation. We both have to be licensed on both sides, um, but we can accomplish that if need be. All right, any more questions, guys? Um, oh, I see David asked, how much is a programming session cost? 
off the top of my head, on average, I believe it's 125 per programming session, except for, I'm going to say Chrysler, I believe it's because they have higher rates. We're using all okay. OEM software and they have, um, they charge us more than the other OEMs. So Yeah, Chrysler definitely went up this year, but everything other than Chrysler is still aligned at the 125 a module session. Yes. So. Um, I think that was our last question. Any any final questions before we wrap up? Oh, I got one more that came in. Do I need FDRS or my IDs or are my sure. IDs good? Okay, so um, FDRS is for select models starting in 2018. If you put IDS on a 2018 Ford Expedition, it will tell you you need to load FDRS for this vehicle. Um, the download's a lot faster than IDS. It kind of piggybacks on the same machine. Um, you just do need an active internet connection when you go to use it. It is included in the same licensing. So for you to, if you have IDS, as long as you're using a VCM2 or later, um, adding FDRS to your system is as simple as adding the download, um, installing it the first time, and it'll prompt for updates as needed after that. And the GM MDI2, um, if it has the same functionality that the Ford VCM2 does, that we can turn it into a J2534 device. Um, there should be a Bosch menu in your windows on the machine that you have that installed in. Let me see if I can find it here real quick. Uh, oh, I don't have it on this machine. I have it on another one. Um, but there should be an option like a J2534 bridge and essentially it just has us punch in the serial number of our VCM, and uh, you know we just put that into this little text box for J2534, and all of a sudden it reads like a J box. So I believe the GM MDI2 has the same functionality. I think it's some of the same hardware building it, um, but I haven't tested it myself. All right, and final question um, I see is, hold on, there you go. Could I use my GM MD? MDI-2 or FDRS for Yeah, for that's FDRS. one we just talked about. And then okay. uh, looks like we have Bob Powell on top. One last question here. Um, IDS and FDRS will work fine together. FJDS or FDRS will work fine together. But you can't have the, the IDS and the J programming software on the same machine. And to that token, if you use Mazda as well, you can't have any version of Ford and Mazda on the same machine, with the exception of piggybacking FDRS on one of the other Ford softwares or Mazda MDARS on top of one of their softwares. All right. All right, I think that is it for questions. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, Chris, any yeah. final words? No, I just, I appreciate the time. And uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot some out. If I get a few minutes, I'll answer them back to you. Uh, yeah, what's any, the email any Gina, that they can, uh, here it is right here on the screen. Uh, yep. Webinars at opusivs.com. All right, thanks guys. Have a great night. All right.